All right, welcome to our second class in the online video class for new members for Still Presbyterian Church, our inquirers class. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel. We are moving in this session from the, the core Christian truths, the essentials that every true Christian believes about Scripture and God and Jesus and salvation. Now we're moving into some Reformed distinctives. And we, I look at this as the, the five, three, five distinctives of being Reformed in your understanding of the Gospel. So let's pray and ask for God's help as we unfold these things together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we can uh, have this lesson in this online video format way. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what it reveals to us about you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your grace that is amazing and abundant through your son, Jesus Christ, applied to us by your Holy Spirit. So we pray that you would be with us as we go through this material, as we learn these truths, that they would not merely be academic things that cool us stay in our head or puff us up with pride, but things that penetrate our heart with a humble understanding of who you are and who we are before you and how utterly dependent we are on you for salvation from beginning to end. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The 535 distinctives. There's five solas of the Reformation. So this is kind of foundational, right? The foundational level is the five solas of the Reformation. And then sort of rising from that are three pillars of Reformed theology. And then sort of crowning it is spelling out the five points of Calvinism. So if you can picture like a, a building, like a classical building being built, there's a foundation being laid in the five solas of the Reformation, pillars being raised in the three pillars of Reformed theology, and then the capstone is in the five points of Calvinism. Now, these things are not unique to Presbyterians at all. These things are held by everyone who would be considered Reformed. So there are many Baptists who hold to this, many Anglicans who hold to this, many non-denominational uh, folks who hold to this. So it's not unique to Presbyterianism, but it is uh, in the line of what's called Calvinism or Reformed theology. So this is all biblical, and when we get to the end, we're going to be bringing it all back to Scripture to see very clearly where this is laid out in the Bible, because our foundation is still in the Word of God. We do not, do not accept a single point of doctrine or a single distinctive that is not from Scripture. So as we move from the essentials to the distinctives, we need to remind ourselves of how much all true Christians agree on. All true Christians agree that God is holy. God is holy, holy, holy. He can have nothing to do with sin. There is no trace of sin in him. His eyes are too pure to look upon sin. He dwells in unapproachable light. He is purity and goodness itself in manifest form as the holy, holy, holy God. Human beings are sinful and lost. We have rebelled against God. We have broken his law. We are corrupt by nature and we are under condemnation. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. There is salvation found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. That's Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. And that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one should boast. So we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone, who is the only way of salvation. We also all agree that not everyone believes in Jesus, and thus not everyone is saved. So understanding this core foundational agreement helps to clear up a lot of misunderstandings. A lot of people who have sort of a character, a cartoon caricature of Calvinism in their minds think, well, if God's predestined you, then there ain't nothing you can do about it. It doesn't matter what you believe or how you live your life. 
There's no point trying. There's no point going to church. There's no point doing evangelism. There's no point doing missions. Because if God's predestined it, then it's just going to happen the way he determined it to happen. No. That is false. That is using one little portion of God's word, this concept of predestination, to try to nullify other important parts of God's word, like the need for faith in Christ, the promise that everyone who believes in him will be saved and will not be put to shame, the call to spread the gospel to the nations, to proclaim Christ, the open call of the gospel that whosoever will may come and receive eternal life by putting their trust in Jesus Christ. All of this is absolutely, we believe it as much as anybody. It is what we believe. The call of the gospel is a universal open call. Whosoever will may come and drink freely of the fountain of living water and find life in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord says in Isaiah, look to me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. This is a this is a call to sinful men and women to look to Jesus Christ for salvation and to be saved by faith alone in him alone. The question that we're addressing is, what makes the difference when the gospel call goes out? What makes the difference between someone who comes to faith in Jesus Christ and someone who does not? Is that difference in that person? Is it that one person is more enlightened, smarter, more spiritual, more receptive, more righteous, more good, more pleasing to God? Or is the difference in the working of the Holy Spirit in the heart so that the Holy Spirit actually draws that person and brings them to Christ and gives them the gift of faith and is the author of salvation and the other not? So where is the difference between those who come to faith in Jesus Christ and those who do not? And that is what really this distinctive is about. <clears throat> so we start backing it up to lay the foundation of this building in the five solas of the Reformation. Now, if you don't speak Latin and you're not familiar with Latin phrases from church history, you might look at these words on the screen and think, I'm not sure what that's really all about. I mean, I get some of it. it. Looks like the word scripture is in there. I see the word Christ. I see the word glory. I, I don't know. I, I know gracias in, uh, in Spanish is thank you, right? I could, could that be the only thank you? So you might be, you know, scratching your head about this. So let's, let's clarify. The word sola or solus, or soli, just three different versions of the same word, means alone or only. Soul, like the sole winner of, you know, the championship. The one and only, solo, okay? And that's so only or alone. The first one is sola scriptura, scripture alone. What do we mean scripture alone? We mean our source of truth from God for everything we need to know for life and godliness, for everything we need to know for the, for the truth of God, for salvation, and for living a life with God comes from Scripture alone, not Scripture plus church tradition. So even though we use, in the Presbyterian Church in America, we use the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Westminster Catechisms to unfold and explain and summarize and apply the teachings of Scripture, 100% of everything we believe comes from Scripture and Scripture alone. Secondly, sola gratia means grace alone. So it is God's grace alone that saves us and not any merit in us. That is anything deserving in us. God wasn't looking around and saying, man, I really need like a six foot six blue eyed bearded guy you know, uh, I'm going to pick Jason because he's going to be on my team, right? Because he saw something in me that he wanted. Or, you know, some people even say needed. Ugh. Don't say God needs anything. Uh, God is gracious, undeserved favor and loving kindness, undeserved generosity, 
and love poured out. God's grace alone saves us. By grace alone, through faith alone. That's the third one, sola fide, through faith alone. It is our faith alone that by which we lay hold of God's gift of salvation in Christ and not our works. So it's scripture alone and not scripture plus tradition, grace alone and not grace plus merit, faith alone and not faith plus works. We don't lay hold of Christ and lay hold of the grace of God by trusting in him and doing good works. The good works follow as a fruit of having laid hold of him, but that's not how we lay hold of him, right? So it is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Solus Christus, Christ alone. So that is not Christ and the saints, right? It's the merit of Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's the finished work of Christ. It's the forgiveness of Christ alone that is our salvation. And then all of our salvation, as with all, all things in the world and the universe, are solely Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. And I love this last one because it was customary, I believe, for both Johann Sebastian Bach and for um, George Frederick Handel to sign their music manuscripts that they were writing SDG, SDG, which is solely Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. That's what they wanted their music to be all about. So they, they, this is the foundation. We get our truth from God, from Scripture alone. God saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. This is another way of putting it. On the basis of the authority of Scripture alone, we believe that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And again, the key verse that really summarizes a lot of this is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that I already quoted for you. For it is by grace, through faith, that you have been saved. And this is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. So we have definitely grace alone and faith alone in there, but we also have so that no one can boast, which means it's to the glory of God alone. And in the context of Ephesians, it's clear that that faith is faith in Christ alone. And we're getting that truth from Scripture, so it's on the basis of Scripture alone. That's our foundation. That's our foundation. And really, I think just about all true Christians hold to this foundational truth. The, these five solas of the Reformation is true, certainly among all, we would say, evangelical Protestants or all Bible-believing Protestants um, hold to these five. By grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone, on the basis of Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. But then rising up, from that foundation, we can picture three pillars that uphold, provide strength for the rest of this house um, of a right understanding of the gospel that we call Reformed theology. And these three pillars are the sovereignty of God, the depravity of man, and the sufficiency of Christ. And it's actually the absolute sovereignty of God, the total depravity of man, and the complete sufficiency of Christ. So pillar number one is telling us about God. Pillar number two is telling us about man. And pillar number three is telling us about Christ. If you remember from our last class, we had this four steps to understand the gospel. We have to understand about God and man and Christ. Well, these three pillars are really kind of help, helping us see that. What about God? Well, God is absolutely sovereign. He rules over all things. What about man? Man is totally depraved. We are sinful, fallen, dead, lost. We cannot save ourselves. And what about Christ? Christ is completely sufficient. If Jesus is your substitute Savior, if he is your substitute Savior, if he took your sins upon himself on the cross and he gave you his righteousness in return, you are saved, period. So let's unpack each one of these for just a few minutes. First, sovereignty. Is God in control or is he not? It is very puzzling to me that so many Christians would acknowledge that God is sovereign over all things. He rules over heaven and earth. He is in control of all things. And yet he's not 
in control of salvation. As if salvation were some sort of unimportant side note or footnote that really has no impact on the rest of the operations of the world or as though it's something that's not important enough for God to take control of or it's something he just leaves free for people to choose by their own free will but he's not going to be sovereign over the outcome and yet somehow he's still sovereign over the outcome of everything else. It's really kind of confusing to have that. We believe that when God in a God who is absolutely sovereign. Psalm 103, 19 tells us that the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. See that little word? All. Not some things, not most things, not a couple of things, not the things that he picks on Monday. All. His kingdom rules over all. Psalm 115, verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. God carries out in the world all that he pleases. And he makes it very clear in Romans 9 that he is pleased to save some for his glory. That's his divine pleasure, his choice to save some. Now, that doesn't mean that God is happy with everything that happens in the world. This is a sort of misunderstanding of divine sovereignty. Some people say, well, is God happy when like babies die in abortion? Is God happy when a hurricane strikes and flattens a village or sends a mudslide down and thousands of people are buried alive? Is God happy when a war breaks out and millions of people are killed? No, it doesn't mean that God's happy with everything that's happening in the world, but he is in control. He is restraining evil and he is ordering things according to his purpose. And that gives us comfort to know that no matter how dark things are, God doesn't rejoice in anything wicked, but he's in control of it. He's limited it, and he has a purpose for it, which means we can always have hope. We don't have to wake up tomorrow morning and think, oh, something happened that completely caught God off guard, and it wasn't part of his plan and purpose, and he doesn't know how he's going to respond to it, and now we have no hope. Now we're in total distress and anxiety, and we're just wringing our hands and ripping our hair out because we don't know if God's going to be in control. God is in control. Isaiah 46, I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. All my purpose. That's, that's God alone. God alone can do that because he is, he is God. He, his counsel shall stand. He will accomplish all of his purpose. And Romans eleven thirty six 36, from him and through him and to him are all things. Not some things, not most things. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The depravity of man. I like that. It says total depravity of man. And then exhibit A is me, my face right next to it. That's good. Um, we're, we're sinful by nature and, and, and we're, we're, we're beyond cure in and of ourselves. We're not just people who mess up a little bit and who could get better if only we tried. The truth is we're not even interested in trying to get better as God measures better. We're just, we're just not. Uh, the truth is what Jeremiah says about us, the heart, the heart of people, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? That's my heart. That's your heart. That's the heart of everybody. Deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. The question, who can understand it? God can. God alone can. Right? Ephesians 2, which we're going to look at in a few minutes, it starts off by talking about the natural condition of all people. It says, and you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of math, wrath like the rest of mankind. I almost said children of math. Math is not wrath. Children, as much as we might not like it. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. 
This is a very sobering and very honest assessment of the natural human condition. How are we born into this world? Dead. Dead. Spiritually. Obviously, we're alive physically, we're alive mentally, we're alive emotionally, we're even alive morally. We have a sense of what's right and wrong, but we're dead spiritually. We're cut off from God. There is no spiritual life in us. Now, let me ask you a very profound and advanced level question. What can a dead man do? I mean, in Weekend at Bernie's, Bernie was able to do all sorts of things, but that's because his friends were propping him up and carrying him around. What can a dead man do? Nothing. Nothing. We are helpless before God. But we're not exactly inactive because Paul says we're walking. So we're the walking dead, spiritual zombies. We're walking. How are we walking? Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and living in the passions of our flesh. I love how right in the middle of this, Paul goes from you, 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 to we, 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 because he can't leave himself out. He can't just say, oh, you Ephesians, how bad you were. He starts off that way, but he's like, no, we all were. We all were that bad, right? So there's a triple enslavement, enslaved to the ways of the world, enslaved to the devil, and enslaved to our flesh. Those are the desires that we have. Because if you think if you're cut off from God, right, if there's no spiritual life and you're cut off from God, what are your options for how you're going to live your life? You can follow the world, you can follow the voice of Satan, or you can follow your own flesh. And those are your options. That's your menu, ladies and gentlemen. You can eat slime, or you can eat mud, or you can eat poop. But you're not going to have anything good for your life on the menu that is before you. That's the way you can walk as a zombie cut off from the life of God. We were not by nature, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That's pretty, that's pretty grim. But we need that honest assessment so we can understand how great the work of salvation is that Jesus has done for us. He has saved us by his love and through his blood. John 6. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. That is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Jesus says twice, no one can. In verse 44 and in verse 65 of John 6, he says, no one can come. No one can come. You can't leave it up to people's free will decision to choose Jesus and be saved. Yes, you give the call of the gospel and you tell people, come to Jesus and find salvation. Look to him and be saved. But your hope cannot be in their own free will decision to just in and of themselves decide that they're going to come. Because Jesus says no one can come. And Paul says we're all dead and children of wrath. So there's nothing in us that would give us any hope of salvation apart from the grace of God. But Christ is an all-sufficient Savior. Amen? Christ is absolutely and completely sufficient. Ephesians 1.7 says, In him that is in Christ, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. All our sins washed away, fully redeemed, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. John 19.30 says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. John 19.30 it is finished means paid in full. The work has been accomplished. Salvation has been secured. There's nothing more to be paid. There's nothing more to be punished. You know, sometimes Christians think we have to punish ourselves to sort of show God how sorry we are. But Jesus already bore all the punishment for us in his body on the cross. So when we punish ourselves, we're actually taking away 
from our faith, our trust in the sufficiency of Christ. That's a pretty serious thing. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, because of him, that is because of God, you are in Christ Jesus. Notice it's, notice it's not because of you. He doesn't say because of your free will choice, you are in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say that. He says because of him, because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Jesus is all of these things. He is wisdom. He is righteousness. He is sanctification. He is redemption. He's the truth that we need and the wisdom that we need. He's our goodness and our fulfillment of the moral law. He's our holiness and our fulfillment of the ceremonial law. He's our redemption. He's the purchase price to redeem us from our lost condition. So if God is absolutely sovereign, and if we are totally depraved, and if Christ is completely sufficient, then salvation must be the work of the Lord and not in any sense our work. I love how Charles Spurgeon put this. This is C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, great 19th century English preacher. And he said, if anyone should ask me what I mean by a Calvinist, I should reply, he is one who says, salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. Because he alone is sovereign over all things, because we are totally depraved in and of ourselves, and Christ alone is an all-sufficient Savior. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, in the 1500s, in the city of Dort, in the Netherlands, there was a controversy that arose where a man named Jacob Arminius was teaching people that some points where he disagreed with John Calvin, who had been the great teacher of the Reformation. And he said, you know, I like Calvin. Actually, Arminius recommended Calvin to his students, uh, especially his Bible commentaries and his Institutes of the Christian Religion. Said, They're great books. You should read these right after the Bible. They're wonderful books. But I have a few points of disagreement. I don't think we're really totally depraved. I just think we're sort of partially depraved and we have a divine spark of prevenient grace that's in our hearts. So it, it, it's not all bad news. We, we've, got, we've got a little bit of light, enough light that we could follow it if we wanted to. He said, I don't think God predestines us or chooses us based upon his love unconditionally, but it's got to be based upon something he sees in us. And he says, and I think that Jesus had to have died in the same way for all people who ever lived, because that seems most fair to me, that his, his death on the cross was equally for all people who ever lived. And when God, the Holy Spirit, draws you, sort of sparking that prevenient grace in you and drawing you to Christ, I think you can resist that. I think you can just say no and walk away. And i um, not sure that everybody who comes to Christ really by God's grace makes it all the way to the end. I think you can fall away and lose your salvation. So Jacob Arminius had these points of disagreement. But each, do you see how each one of those points of disagreement takes away from one of the three pillars that we talked about? If we are not totally depraved, but only somewhat depraved, how is it that Paul could say we were dead in our trespasses and sins? He doesn't say we were sick with trespasses and sins. He said we were dead. And how is it that Jesus said no one can come if we have the spark of prevenient grace within us that would allow us to be able to come? And if God sees something in me that's the basis of his choosing me, again, how is Christ an all-sufficient Savior? Then there's something in me. If Jesus died in the same way for all people, fully intending to save all of them, but I get saved and my neighbor doesn't, then he must not be an absolutely sufficient savior. There must be something deficient in his work of salvation that I've had to make up in my own coming to him or trusting in him or obeying him. You see, each one of those five points of disagreement that Jacob Arminius had was a problem 
because it struck at these vitals of a strong view of God and of our need and of Christ's salvation. And so a synod was convened in Dort, a group of pastors and theologians, and they came up with a response to Arminius's five points of disagreement. So the five points of Calvinism, if you've heard of them, they were not written by John Calvin. And they were never written by anybody with an intention that here's a summary of our system of doctrine. They weren't written for that purpose. They were written to respond against someone who was within the Reformed Church in the Netherlands who was questioning these five particular areas. And of course, they were written first in, in Dutch and in Latin. And at some time when they came over into America, because they came from the Netherlands and they grow a lot of tulips in the Netherlands, someone thought it would be helpful, a helpful way to remember, to sort of summarize these with the, with the acronym TULIP, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And it is helpful for remembering as a, as a memory tool, but it's not always helpful for really understanding what these points mean. Okay, uh, Let's start with the most controversial one, limited atonement. Limited atonement sounds like Jesus' death wasn't good enough. It sounds like it's undermining the sufficiency of Christ as our Savior. That's not at all what is intended. So I think a better way of understanding that is effectual atonement or effective atonement or or complete atonement for God's chosen ones, for those for whom Christ intended to be the complete and all-sufficient Savior. You see, when Jesus offered himself up on the cross, God had already chosen who was going to be saved and Jesus died very specifically to save those people. That is unconditional election. God chose through nothing he saw in us, but through his own goodness and love. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, as Ephesians 1 put it, so that we would be saved and Christ died for us in a saving way. Now, it doesn't mean that he didn't die for other men to give them other benefits. I actually believe that every bit of God's grace and favor and kindness, which would include his common grace that all people experience throughout this life, things like the sun rising and the rain falling and, and food to eat and friendships and laughter, all of that goodness from God was purchased by Christ on the cross for all people. But full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a savior was only for those who were intended to be redeemed. Otherwise, you have this problem. If Jesus died for all of the sins of all people throughout all time, then why does anyone ever go to hell? Hell would be empty if Jesus died for all of the sins of all people across all time. But that's not true. So, Irresistible grace is another one that is hard to understand because it makes it sound like, well, I resist God's grace all the time. It's just talking about the moment of salvation, when God brings you from spiritual death to spiritual life, when he opens your eyes, when he brings you to, to faith in Jesus Christ, you are a dead person who's being brought to life. You are one who cannot come, who is being brought. And so you come. And even perseverance of the saints makes it sound like one way this has been misinterpreted is by the phrase, once saved, always saved. And while that's true, that's also a misinterpretation because the way that's been understood is, if I walk an aisle and pray a prayer and get baptized, then I am definitely going to heaven no matter how I live my life from that moment on. That's unbiblical and that's unhelpful, untrue, misleading not biblical. It's not right. What perseverance of the saints means is that God, God keeps those he saves. If he saves you by bringing you to Jesus, he's going to keep you in Jesus. Now, you may have periods of wandering. I've had periods of wandering in my life. 
wandering away from the faith, doubting God's goodness, you know, not obeying God as I should. But God will always bring you back if you are one of his own. The essence of Calvinism, the real essence of what it really means to be a Calvinist, I think is summarized very well by John Piper when he says the fundamental issue for John Calvin from the beginning of his life to the end was the issue of the centrality and supremacy and majesty of the glory of God, of the glory of God. R.C. Sproul, great theologian, passed away a couple years ago. R.C. Sproul had a wonderful way of putting this. He says, if you ask what the essential difference is between the Calvinist doctrine of God and the non-Calvinist doctrine of God, I would have to say it's very little. There's very little difference in the doctrine of God between someone who's a Calvinist and someone who's not a Calvinist. We say God is holy, we say God is sovereign, we say God is eternal and immutable and unchangeable and all-powerful and all-knowing. He's all those things that we talked about in the first class. Pretty much every Christian would agree with that. He says, but then he says, but if you were to ask me what is the key and essential difference then between Calvinists and non-Calvinists, I would say, aha, it is our doctrine of God. And you might think, what in the world? You just said there's no difference in your doctrine of God, but you said the difference is the doctrine of God. And here's what he means. Others do theology, and they talk about God, and they affirm all the things that the Bible says about God. But then they move on to talk about people and about salvation, and they forget all the things that they said about God. That he's sovereign, that he's in control, that he knows everything, that he plans from the beginning from the end. And they don't, they don't bring the doctrine of God to bear on the doctrine of salvation. It's almost like they're two separate conversations. The central issue is the supremacy and the majesty of the glory of God from beginning to end. The essence of the five points of Calvinism is this. We are dead in our sins and we cannot save ourselves nor do we even want to be saved, because we're dead. God alone can bring us life and bring us to Christ. When God is bringing us from death to life, his gracious drawing of us in a transformation of heart and mind that we cannot resist, we are passive. We are passive in this initial process. It is solely the work of God, and we cannot resist it. And God chooses to save us because he loves us, not because of anything he sees in us, but purely because of his love, his unique, distinct love for us as his own children, his own beloved. Jesus Christ alone is completely sufficient for salvation. If he died and rose again for you, you are saved. If he died and rose again for me, I am saved. And I will come to experience that salvation by coming to faith in him. And I will be kept in that salvation until the end. But that salvation was accomplished on the cross. In other words, when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it. It was finished. Finished. Got it? And the final one is, once we belong to God, we cannot be lost. We will be kept in the faith and in Jesus Christ forever. Now, what we're going to do in the close here, we've only got about less than 10 minutes left. But what we're going to do in the close here is I'm going to take you quickly through four passages of Scripture where this is laid out very clearly. And you'll see it for yourself in these passages of Scripture. John 10, I'm sorry, John 6, John 10, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2. There are many other passages and verses I could give you, but I want to look at passages instead of single verses so that you can see the whole context of what is being taught. This is John chapter 6, where Jesus talks about being the bread of life. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So you see that open call, the universal call of the gospel? Whoever, whoever comes to me shall not hunger, whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And again, we affirm that. That is absolutely true. Those are the words of Jesus. You can't disagree with them. But, Jesus himself says, but, but I said to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So again, what's the issue? Why is it that some people can see Jesus or hear about Jesus and not believe? You've seen me and not believe. All that the Father gives me 
will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. There you go. You have predestination, election, right? You have irresistible grace in coming. And then you have perseverance of the saints being kept to the end. All that the Father gives me, that's predestination, election, will come to me, irresistible grace. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out perseverance of the saints. You got three of the points of Calvinism in one verse, John 6, 37. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's perseverance of the saints by the preservation of God's grace, if there ever was. Now verse 44, we're jumping down a little bit. You can read the whole thing later. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. There's your total depravity. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There's irresistible grace, and I will raise him up on the last day. There's perseverance of the saints. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who were, who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. He knew from the beginning. That's because it's predestined. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So those who weren't believing in him, this is the truth of John 6. Those who were not believing in him, it was because it was not granted to them by the Father. They were not given by the Father to the Son, and that's why they didn't come. John 10. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Again, this universal call. I am the door. If anyone, anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the wolves. No, that's not what it says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the goats. That's not what it says either. Lays down his life for the sheep. Now you keep that in mind. He says it again here in 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. There's a group called my own. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep, the sheep who are my own. That's who Jesus says he lays his life down for in verse 11 and in verse 15. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep, for my own. So the Jews gathered around and he said to them, and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Notice he says in verse 24, You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. You're not among the ones I lay down my life for. You're not among my own whom I know and who know me. That's why you don't believe. He doesn't say... He doesn't say, you're not one of my sheep because you don't believe. He says, you don't believe because you're not one of my sheep. So important to understand what he is saying and what he isn't saying. This is the words of Jesus. You have to agree with them if he's your Lord and Savior. You don't believe because you're not my sheep. He doesn't say, you're not my sheep because you don't believe. He says, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. My sheep, what is it about my sheep? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. That is, I love them. They're mine. They're my own. They hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, 
and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. There you have limited atonement and the perseverance of the saints. So between John 6 and John 10, you have all the points of Calvinism from the lips of Jesus. I'll show you where else we have them very quickly, and I know we're running a little bit over time. Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. These are, this is the word of God, and the word of God says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, and he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to, according to what? According to my goodness, according to my beauty? I mean, obviously it's my beauty, right? No, it's according to the purpose of his will. The purpose of his will. With which he has blessed us, sorry, to the praise of his glorious grace. According to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. Soli Deo Gloria. With which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Which he lavished upon us. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of his will. The purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Learn how to read, Jason. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. That's Ephesians 1. It's about as clear as clear gets in the plain old language. We're predestined. We're chosen. We're purposed by God, according to the counsel of his will, to the praise of his glory. And finally, here's Ephesians 2. And you being dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But... God. The two most glorious words in the universe when you're down a rabbit hole like that is but God. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, Ephesians 2 comes after Ephesians 1, right? And so God predestines us and chooses us and blesses us. And then we see how that works out in his saving of us and keeping of us. It's glorious good news. It's the gospel. It's something to be rejoiced in and celebrated and rested in because it's true. It's true truth from the word of God. And all praise and glory be to his name for his salvation of us because we didn't deserve it. We didn't do it. He did it all. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for saving us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Father, that's the truth of the gospel. And it's our hope for eternal life. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.